Good evening. Today is Monday, February 13, 2023, and this is the 137th episode of New Paradigms. I'm your host, Sarge Singiri. Before we begin our podcast tonight, I do want to take this opportunity again for the second week in a row to pass on our collective prayers to all the people that are currently suffering from the after effects of the powerful 7.8 magnitude earthquake, which was also followed by a 7.5 magnitude quake nine hours later, hitting uh, southern Turkey and also parts of Syria killing more than now almost 22,000 plus people in his wake. Uh, as the people within the region are now fighting for survival in the wake of uh, one of the strongest earthquakes to hit that region in almost a century and one of the coldest months, we ask our viewing audience out there to please keep these people in your prayers. And also at the same time, please keep their first responders and also to humanitarian organizations and supporters that are either in country or moving into the region to be able to be with them in order to support their efforts. May God keep him in his light. Before we begin our discussion today with one of my guests who is gonna be heading down the range, a word from our sponsor, Epoch Times. We are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epoch Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. The Epoch Times is independent. We're not controlled by any special interest, and we never will be. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit, a battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance, and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. Subscribe today to our digital edition at theepochtimes.com and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. Read the difference in all your devices. We'd love to have you on board. My guest today is one of those uh, humanitarian supporters I spoke to you earlier in my uh, monologue. Um, and uh, uh, look, uh, she is a longtime friend and also an Assyrian American activist uh, from Iran, Juliana Tamarazi. Juliana is a fa- founder and the current president of the Iraqi Christian Relief Council, ICRC, which is a position that she has held now since uh, its inception in 2007. Tamarazi was inspired, as she says, uh, to start the Iraqi Christian Relief Council after uh, being told by then uh, Cardinal Francis George of Chicago that it was her calling. And he stated it really specifically because of her work and her efforts with the Catholic Charities. From uh, 2015 to 2020, uh, Juliana was also a senior fellow with the Philos Project, an organization that aims to increase Christian engagements uh, in the Middle East and throughout the Near East region. Uh, Juliana became a refugee when her family left Iran in 1989 and was subsequently granted asylum into the United States at the age of 17 in 1990. During uh, further persecution of Assyrians uh, within the region because of the United States invasion of Iraq, uh, Juliana began volunteering with the Catholic Charities in uh, 2006 in order to be able to mentor young Assyrian women who were leaving Iraq for the United States at the time. Juliana now travels uh, from Iraq uh, Iraq, uh, to uh, the United States and vice versa in order to support with humanitarian efforts and distributions of humanitarian aid by her organization. In 2016, during the height of the uh, newest Assyrian genocide being perpetrated by ISIS, ICRC uh, was able to provide 95,000 Assyrian families in Iraq with humanitarian aid. And as a senior fellow with the Philos Project at that time, she was also able to spearhead the digital NIMIC campaign, which uh, uh, raised funds and also provided laptops to Assyrian students in Assyrian name of playing AMP. Uh, in her capacity as a humanitarian representative in Iraq, uh, Juliana has also met with multiple Iraqi parliamentarians to discuss the creation of a needed Christian province in order to keep the root of Christianity alive in the region. In 2020 and 2022, Juliana was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize based on her work and for her efforts to help the uh, Christian communities in Iraq and also those who have been displaced 
uh, to other nations and other countries in the region, uh, given the violence. On uh, 20, uh, June 20, 2022, Juliana was also awarded the Medal of Valor for by Simon Weinstein Center in Chicago. Uh, this award is uh, one of the most uh, prestigious medals that is awarded uh, to those who actually serve in the military, but also at the same time, sometimes is also awarded to civilians uh, for their contribution to humanity overall. Uh, Juliana is uh, uh, now headed into the region for support of the earthquake victims uh, who need uh, major funding and support for those Assyrian families that have been now affected by this tragedy. Before I bring uh, Juliana in for future uh, for a discussion, uh, there's a video that I want to make sure that we kind of reset and let our audience know what is happening in the region. Juliana, welcome to the show. I know it's under difficult circumstances, but uh, this is a reason why uh, you know you have this calling to be able to go out and uh, help uh, individuals who are suffering these type of uh, tragic uh, realities. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, Sergis. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, watching these images, really, they are absolutely heart-wrenching. Uh, I'm barely composing myself. And I've seen these clips over and over again, as we all have. Uh, but this is really uh, a human tragedy that we cannot allow go off the radar. Uh, because as I'm looking for information, it doesn't come up as the first piece of news or the second piece of news anymore. anymore. I have to really dig deep to find detailed information about this which is unfortunate, but I'm so glad to be here. I'm honored to, that uh, I'm able to give, I'm given this chance to address your audience. Thank you. No, look, uh, uh, I kind of laid it out in my monologue, the type of work you have done. Really, we didn't cover everything in your bio, but uh, I'm glad that you made the decision a long time ago that, you know, I have to be able to help, especially the Assyrian Christian community that really doesn't have any advocates out there or anybody at the table to be able to move something along for them. Um, tell me a little bit about where we are right now with the current efforts of your organization. I know you're heading down range, uh, but I know that you guys already started some work. Uh, what has happened to the Assyrian community that has suffered in both Syria and Turkey? Uh, so let's talk about Syria first, if you don't mind. Uh, we have approximately 10 Assyrian and Syriac individuals that have passed away. Uh, there are countless of Armenians that uh, have passed away. I know of six, but I hear the number is rising. Uh, young men, 
Um, we have had casualties among Greek Orthodox uh, members in, uh, in Syria. It is very difficult to bring aid to them because of the embargo. Um, the image that you see is of a mother and a child, Assyrians, who are Iraqi refugees. These are Iraqi Christians in Turkey uh, that just were perished um, and they were pulled out, deceased. So uh, it is very difficult really to work in Syria, as you know. Uh, as I'm hearing the rumor, the rumor has it that uh, the sanctions have been lifted uh, until August. Uh, it is, is this true or not? I've had my, I've asked my attorneys to look into it to make sure if it is safe to wire money. But at this time, it's extremely difficult. And this is not something just I face, I'm faced with. There are multiple uh, advocacy organizations that are trying to figure out how can we assist people in Syria. But my focus right now is Turkey. Uh, I have my partners on the ground in Turkey that I have worked with for many years. Uh, you see Iraqi Christian Relief Council as a program specific to helping refugees, not just people in Iraq, but also our refugees in Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. The program is called I Adopt a Refugee. And because of my relationship with um, uh, the priest on the ground, Father uh, Ramzi Daril of the Archdiocese of Istanbul, uh, we immediately sprung to into action. That same night, uh, it was probably 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. when I heard about this uh, catastrophe. Um, at 6 a.m., I contacted my uh, team, my board, and I said, we've got to do something. Immediately, we started asking for funding for my partner from my donors, my very generous donors, and knowing that my partner is trustworthy and he, I've worked with, with him for many years, I knew he would also deliver immediately. So the images that you see, we have, we're three teams working together. Uh, this uh, is new, a new group that we've just started working and they're just blowing uh, it, uh, hitting the ball out of the park, as they say. Um, with with how they are so dedicated. As an example, these individuals you see, they are Iraqi Christian Assyrian refugees themselves from northern Iraq who've lived, basically have been trapped in Turkey for about nine years post-ISIS. Uh, but they themselves have organized a put together an organization. And the three of us, myself, Father Ramsey of the Archdiocese of Istanbul and this organization, were delivering funds. They drove by two vans, uh, the first distribution um, for eight hours in the middle of snow, in the middle of ice. Uh, they kept on sending me images and videos of how bad the road was, but they arrived. And, you know, I spoke to them for the first time yesterday because the internet was so bad. And they said that when you walk, it is a ghost town. They said, when we walked on the rubble, we knew there's life underneath us, but it smelled like death, Sargis. It is, the way they were describing it was chilling. Um, this image is actually from Syria, people living in uh, churches in Syria, in northern Syria. Um, so we have been able to make four distributions in Turkey, uh, reaching out to as many people as possible. From what I know, in Turkey, there are uh, Armenians, Greek Orthodox, Chaldean, uh, Assyrians of the Chaldean faith, the Assyrians and Syriacs, uh, all together in seven churches close by, and they're afraid of going somewhere else, this group of people, this, I believe, from Syria as well. Um, and But a lot of these refugees, it's important to mention that a lot of Syrian Muslims, as you know, and a lot of Syrian Christians and Iraqi Christians fled to Turkey post-ISIS and the war in Syria and in Iraq. So uh, these are the people that are devastated as well. They had very little to nothing to begin with, and now they're stricken with the disaster. So a lot of them have traveled somehow to Istanbul, and they're staying with other uh, uh, Assyrian refugees who are already strapped, who already don't have anything. So the situation is dire. From what I'm told, this will continue for many months to come. So we definitely need your support, your prayers. Um, it's very difficult to transport things. So the best thing is for us to have funding. Uh, and in some cases, it's difficult to purchase things. This is a young man, a champion and, and an athlete, actually, who... Um, passed away, unfortunately, he's Armenian. 
And um, and this is a priest as well. He uh, was buried yesterday. Just heartbreaking, heartbreaking. These are two Armenians in Turkey. The other two were in Syria. These two women, mother and daughter, are in Turkey. Uh, so please remember that this is a long, long, long journey ahead. My ministry is not endowed. We rely heavily on individual donations, churches, and foundations. And yes, uh, Sergis, I am on my way uh, to Turkey. Uh, I'm going. In fact, the trip was planned, uh, Sergis, three months ago, because we have about twenty-two thousand Assyrian refugees in the Middle East in uh, these three countries, and uh, they're not moving. They've been stuck there for eight, nine years. So what we wanted to do, what we will do is record their lives in their own uh, voice. And we will present it to different ambassadors, to different NGOs, to different to offices and UNHCR, uh, hoping that they can be mobilized, at least to be resettled outside the region. That's what they want. But then this uh, calamity happened. So uh, uh, we will be going to affected areas as well to bring aid. No, oh, look, uh, you have to. I, I know you mentioned uh, just uh, trying to get aid into the region. I know we're working with uh, a Turkish uh, company um, is well known. And for them, just to get their trucks to move from Istanbul to the earthquake region, you're talking about almost 12 hours or 15 hours, and it's very difficult. And on the way back, when they were trying to uh, uh, really come back and pick up uh, more humanitarian aid, um, they were asked if they could dispatch a couple of their uh, trucks in order to move the bodies. Um, it is possible that you may have almost 100,000 people that might be somewhere underneath the rubble. And as you said, uh, the region there, you know, I've been in the military, so I've been in areas where you can tell, uh, you know, uh, someone has died for a long period of time and it's a, a smell uh, that stays with you. Uh, for a lifetime, and I know that that is the first thing that is impacting a lot of the first responders. And uh, when you get on the ground, you're probably going to get impacted by it too uh, as you arrive in the region. You're not prepared for it, but it's a reality of what happens when uh, you have uh, bodies underneath the rubble that you're not able to extract. Um, I do know that uh, you mentioned the internet issue. I do know that Elon Musk uh, had uh, been contacted as far as trying to get Starlink into the region. But again, it becomes one of those political issues, like you said, sanctions possibly being removed from the Syrian government. Um, and uh, I don't think Starlink was given approval, at least now currently by the Turkish government to be able to be established, to at least be able to get the news and information out as to what is happening within the region. At the same time, I know that uh, John Kirby had talked about uh, recently, just as of a couple of days ago, uh, or last week, I should say, uh, that, uh, you know, U.S. aid is going to be on the ground um, in the region. But uh, as of today, I still haven't seen any contracts, major contracts that have been awarded through U.S. aid for support in the region. So politics uh, does become an issue. The civil war does become an issue. Um, and I know it's very hard for organizations like you to be able to maneuver uh, through that minutia in order to be able to just uh, save those eaches uh, that need that help on the ground. There's a video that we have as to what the impact on Syria has been. Uh, I want to start with that and then come back and uh, continue our discussion and get your thoughts as to what can we do, you think, on the ground through those networks to be able to maybe have the effects to be able to help out the people of Syria. A warning, her report contains images of people who have died in the earthquake. These were once houses, people's homes. The devastation in Idlib in northwest Syria is immense, and they know all about misery here. They've endured 12 years of war. Now they're fighting to survive a natural disaster, and they're doing it in the awful realization that once again, they're on their own. So they dig through the night. The white helmets so used to pulling people out of bombed buildings now trying to sift through rubble to find those who survived the war, only to die trapped and terrified in the earthquake. They've just found the body of a four-year-old boy still in his pajamas. His father can hardly contain his despair and disgust at how he was left to die alone with no help from outside. 
مين بده يساعدنا نحن؟ Who is helping us? In Turkey, they're getting everything. They've made a special air bridge to bring aid from all around the world. But no one is coming to help us. What did this child do wrong to stay four days underground before we found him? And the agony's not over yet for him. The white helmets are trying to find his wife and his elder son, who's 10. Both are still missing. The people here are saying this is a real tragedy because it could have been all so different if they'd been given extra specialist, more sophisticated equipment with which to try and locate these people. Remember, some have already been taken out of here alive, but now the chances of finding anyone else alive are extremely remote. They're exhausted, but they go on. Few have escaped the agony of loss, either through the war or now the earthquake. They know the importance of finding at least the bodies to grieve and play over. Have you found anything? No is the constant answer. Even finding the body of a loved one is some small comfort in this part of Syria, where comfort is a scarcity. I also lost my son. I feel the same sorrow because I lost family too. I know this man is tortured inside. To find his wife and son is a matter of life or death for me. Two fathers with a bond of suffering binding them together, a common understanding of the agony of losing a precious child. The search goes on all night. The head of the militant rebel group in Idlib turned up to offer support and give a rare interview, and he was blisteringly critical of the world's response. They're taking too much time, and it's costed lives for those trapped under the rubble. We've lost a lot of lives because of the weak response of the international community. They're the ones responsible. He was once a member of the terror group Al-Qaeda, before forming his own Islamist militant group, now focused on fighting AQ as well as ISIS and the Assad regime in Damascus. He has a $10 million bounty on his head, but he tore into Western leaders for ignoring the needs of civilians in Idlib. The people who died in the earthquake were not terrorists. They were innocent civilians. They were women and children. So to confuse humanitarian issues with politics is a big problem. There are only bodies coming over the Turkish-Syria border in any quantity right now. Little meaningful aid has made it across. These are people who have fled the war in Syria to find sanctuary in neighboring Turkey. Now being returned in body bags, it is the saddest of homecomings for their relatives. So they're having to make mass graves in Idlib to cope with the hundreds coming home from across the border, as well as those who've perished here. They simply can't make them quickly enough. They were already struggling with the impact of an unequal war, now more unbearable loss. A final kiss for a newborn baby, a life cut off before it had even really begun. This is a tragedy on top of a grinding war and earthquake calamity. They're talking here of deaths after the quakes caused by poor medical facilities, of the struggle without shelter, of the need for food and water, of the urgency for just about everything. So there is misery upon misery and the news no one wanted. <laughs> Salim found his wife and son's bodies and with that discovery, a whole new depth to his suffering. He's now lost half of his family, two sons and their mother. For a child in Idlib, there seems no end to grief. Life for them is all about death. Salim has to somehow console his one surviving daughter, eight-year-old Mace. Calm down, my daughter, he says. OK, my love? This is God's will. Do you love me? 
I'll always be with you, he says. They have each other, but that is all. The trauma in Idlib never seems to stop. It just gets worse and worse. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Idlib, Syria. Juliana, your thoughts. I'm, re I'm reminded of uh, Genesis. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, they say, God says, God asks Adam, where are you? In Hebrew, it's uh, Ayaka. In our language, in Aramaic and Assyrian, it's Ikit. It doesn't mean, because that's when Adam had hid himself after um, he ate from the tree of knowledge. And it doesn't mean that God didn't know where he was. He was trying to remind Adam about his location, about Adam's own location. And that's what I'm reminded of, that God is asking us, Ikit, Ayeka, where are you? He knows where we are. Do we know where we are as the world? How can we be silent and watch this as this unfolds? The, some, I mean, you know, I, I could go on and say the world should have moved faster. Uh, if indeed the sanctions have been lifted, they should have been lifted. The first moment that this happened, uh, corruption needs to end. Turkey's, uh, Turkey, Syria, that whole region is corrupted. And that needs to end. Now it's a matter of life and death. We see it unfolding in front of our eyes. So what kind of a world are we leaving the next generation and the generation after and beyond? Someday they will rise and they will condemn us for how we answered these tragedies. Uh, you know, as you say, uh, and the Bible says that the uh, men of Nineveh will rise up and will condemn this generation. And uh, uh, frankly, it's a reality of it. Uh, you know, you look at a map, you see a difference between where Turkey is uh, and uh, Syria, but on the ground, really, it doesn't mean anything. One 15-inch step, you're in Turkey. One 15-inch step, you're in Syria. Reality is that people are suffering. And I know it's unfortunate when people hear and uh, they say, okay, well, what's the first thing you do as an organization is, as you had to say, uh, and your instinct is right, I got to talk to my lawyer to see whether or not, uh, you know, uh, we can even function as a humanitarian organization to support these people because, you know, governments have their own wants and desires that has nothing to do when it comes to being tied to the reality of what these people are suffering. So um, you have to, you know, walk through that process uh, as to, uh, you know, what the Syrian government wants, what the U.S. government wants, what the Turks want, what NATO wants, what the regional leaders want, what Russia wants in the region, what the Chinese uh, Communist Party through the China Co Corporation Organization is trying to have effects within that region. And you have to walk through this minefield just to be able to get food and water to one individual on the ground to be able to support them. Uh, but it's reality, at least we have individuals like you who are out there trying to do that. Um, I know we got the uh, word uh, just uh, last week again that possibly there was a family of six Assyrian Christians that had just received their papers to come to the United States and possibly four of those six perished. Another two don't even have access possibly to their documentation to be able to get to the U.S. Embassy for approval to also uh, expedite their uh, uh, process of being able to fly to the United States to be with family members if they have any here. Um, I know that uh, when we are looking at what happened to certain Christians in Syria, I was on stage uh, just five minutes before I went on uh, for our anti-terrorism conference in 2015 is when I got the call that, hey, they're starting to clear the uh, Assyrian villages uh, because ISIS has started moving against them and Khabar River. And uh, now I know that most of those villages, the Assyrian have been uh, basically flung all over the map. Uh, we don't know where they are. Uh, the entire region is suffering. But I'm glad we have organizations like you, at least on the ground, trying to make changes. Let me ask you, uh, um, Juliana, uh, some of the organizations are on the ground that are trying to help. Who are they? Uh, that you have possibly a partnership or a uh, relationship with uh, that you're 
able to at least say, hey, I need you to do this for me uh, while I'm, uh, you know, trying to at least collect funds to be able to support the people in the region. Uh, one of the organizations that I really admire is called Assyrians Without, Board- Assyrians Without Borders. Uh, they're based in Sweden. And um, they and uh, we have decided to collaborate on this one. This is going to be the first time we collaborate where we, from afar, each of us have been admiring each other's work. So uh, we're covering two separate, each of us are covering two separate parts of the affected areas. So we, um, in fact, we're doing a live program together tomorrow on uh, my Instagram. Um, and uh, the the individual, the head of the organization, may fly out to uh, join forces with me when I'm there on the ground. So this is one of the uh, most important organizations that I fully trust that they've been doing phenomenal work. Um, also, as I said, Father Ramsey Daril, who is a young priest, he uh, what he just became a priest in 2015. Uh, and uh, actually maybe late 2014, early 2015, but 50,000 Assyrian Christians flooded Turkey, and he single-handedly uh, started taking care of uh, So we work with him. He belongs to the Archdiocese of Istanbul. So, um, so these two individuals, these two entities, plus this new organization, which I believe it's an Arabic term, but I think if I translate it correctly, it's charity brings us together. That's the Arab, the English translation. Um, they've exhibited such bravery. They've exhibited such accountability because I have fiduciary responsibility for every dollar that comes in. And I've seen these guys just work through day and night for three, for two days. They hadn't slept. They hadn't eaten, um, but they delivered the aid that was needed. But they were telling me that there's so much that is necessary that they don't have in these destroyed areas. So what they had to do is to drive back eight hours to Tokat, to refuel, to get more um, uh, things that are needed, more specific things. And a lot of kids are suffering. They were telling me that uh, th- these images are of our first distribution. Uh, they were telling me that they need dried milk. Um, they need uh, baby diapers. Uh, they need uh, women need hygiene products. I mean, the Sergius John, these are the basic necessities that a human being must have access to, and that has been stripped away from them yet again. Because just eight, nine years ago, these people went through this with ISIS. And then prior to that, a few years prior to that was Al-Qaeda. So this is uh, a generation. You know, if we if we zoom out a little bit and we look at the entire, specifically about the Assyrian plight, this generation of ours right now that has not been able to be educated, that hasn't worked, their dignity has been stripped away, yeah. have been able to take care of their children and their husbands the way they want to. This is a lost generation, and it pains me to say this, but we have to face reality. So this is why we want to go and record and spread across the globe the stories of the Iraqi Christians. And, you know, your listeners, your viewers, I am sure they already, because of you, are familiar with who Assyrians are. We are over 6,000 years uh, of, uh, of peoples. Strong heritage. We brought Christianity to the East, to China, to the Philippines, uh, to the to Tibet, and to Japan. Um, once we were the strongest uh, thought leaders in the Middle East, um, in Mesopotamia, and look, we have been destroyed, and our community, our families have been destroyed. But I tell you, as an Assyrian, as a proud Assyrian, I always give hope. Because um, a beautiful, a beautiful quote that says, "Amidst despair, there is sanity of hope." Uh, I believe it is from Cindy Kojak, and we have to give each other hope. Hope is the only thing that keeps us alive, that moves us, brings us to action. Correct? And I say, I liken the Assyrian nation to a beautiful crystal bowl that has been dropped, has been shattered into a thousand pieces across the room. That room is our world, our globe. But that is an opportunity for us to be the ray of light because each crystal piece still possesses its essence, correct? So each of us Assyrians should utilize the opportunity to educate others around us about who we are, about our beautiful traditions, 
our beautiful sacred language, Aramaic, which is the language of Christ, as we all know. So we, you and I, um, are the voices, two of the vo- of many voices that are trying to keep our heritage alive. Right now, we need you. I need your listeners. I need your listeners, friends and family to really step up, help us preserve the, the human factor. Humanity is suffering. And you know, um, in my podcast, it's called Ancient Paths. Uh, Dr. David Patterson, who is a professor at UT Dallas, said to me, you know, Juliana, God is buried under that rubble. And he is crying out, where are you? No, well said, Ju- Juliana. I mean, uh, you know, let's see if people will listen. Unfortunately, they've uh, kind of turned themselves off from what needs to be done, which is really to be able to help these people in the uh, in the region. I Juliana, have faith your listeners are those. I have, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I really no, have faith okay. you are not spectators. Uh, I believe that I have faith in that because of who you are, because how you have served this nation. And I thank you for serving the United States of America and defending this beautiful land that we call home today. Um, Elie Wiesel once said, uh, opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And let yeah. us not be different. Well, look, uh, we're going to try to do our best. Uh, um, I know we have a short time here, but we're going to try to do our best to do what we can to coordinate those efforts. Um, I do have to take a break. Um, unfortunately, Juliana, halfway through the show program, um, a message from our sponsor. And when we come back, we'll talk about how we can maybe get all these uh, um, efforts coordinated together. We are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epoch Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. The Epoch Times is independent, We're not controlled by any special interest, and we never will be. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit, a battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. Subscribe today to our digital edition at theepochtimes.com and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. Read the difference in all your devices. We'd love to have you on board. Juliana, I do want to start uh, the um, rest of the program with a video that we had because of some of the work they have already done. There is a subtitle in English, uh, but it's uh, from families downrange, Assyrian Christian families, uh, some of the ways what you have done been, has been able to help them. Uh, so I'm going to start with that video and uh, get your thoughts as far as uh, where else we can go. الاخو انا حرب الشلمون اسماعيل من محافظه الازخي في مخي زلزال جامد على بسط منظمه اي سي ار سي كي مساعدكم شطرا لالا وني انا ثلاثه من الاخو اشتاق لكم انا غالب كمال جبرائيل من محافظه الازخ شكرا لكم قال لك لي مساعدكم شدوت لينا وشكرا منظمه اي سي ار سي لي مساعدكم شدري لي بيكم خيرين لي وهذا بس مراد قاسم you know, Juliana, the testimonies are important. Um, and I know you and me have been dealing with this. You know, I established United Assyrian Appeal uh, to help with the multi families in uh, 2014, 2015, as we were running four structures on the ground. Look, People came to me for support and I said, I can't support everyone. I had a certain mission set and I had to make the hard call sometimes and say, look, I, I can only support the multifamilies. I know your organization was picking up the slack, helping the refugee cause. And what I couldn't support, I would say, go work with Juliana's organization or other organizations that can help. 
because it's really, I mean, you're l literally trying to do what a, a nation state uh, can do. And you can see right now, Turkey struggling to even uh, save his own people. Syria, whether or not they care or not, they're indifferent, trying to uh, support any of their people. So what we're doing from the Syrian perspective and what you're doing is really trying to run a, a nation that is within 43 different countries. Assyrians are all over the globe. Uh, and uh, as you stated so well in the previous portion of our segment, that it might be a dead generation because they haven't had the opportunities that were being given to them because of the fact that you, we went through another genocide, 2014 to 2017, natural disasters hitting us, not being able to really get all the families in places where they could work together. Almost every country that we lived in, whether it was Iran, you left uh, because of the Iranian uh, revolution. I had to leave Iran because of the revolution and whatever money that we had made was left back there. Uh, and then uh, moving to Iraq, what happened with Iraq itself collapsing internally with the war that took place and our Syrians becoming refugees with what happened in Syria, really all the areas that the Syrians did have a homestead in absolutely in chaos uh, over the past uh, few decades. With that said, there's, as you were saying, hope in a way we could maybe uh, uh, tie that effort together. What are some of the, uh, based on your experience and your work in these fields, what are some of the guidance you could give to Assyrians that are out there and other organizations and how they can maybe help you and support you or partner uh, in helping with at least what is happening on the ground today in both Syria and Turkey? You know, um, I really admire the Jewish community. The Jewish community comes together immediately. They get organized extremely quickly and they assist uh, those who are in need. Um, unfortunately, I have not seen uh, too many Assyrian organizations rising to the occasion or even making statements, simple statements, uh, Assyrian organizations, institutions, and etc. This is a monumental task, as you're saying, Sargis, and uh, Juliana alone cannot do it. Uh, Farid, who is the president of Assyrians Without Borders, cannot do it alone. We have to come together and collaborate, not just with one another, but invite uh, non-Assyrians to come together with us to serve humanity. One of the reasons why Iraqi Christian Relief Council was established was to reach out to non-Assyrians to, number one, educate them about who we are and what our plight has been. Two, ask for prayers. Three, ask for help. Whether it's advocacy help, funding help, uh, prayer, prayer campaigns, that is what our first function has always been, reaching out to others to bring them here. So, um, what I'm asking other Assyrian organizations are is to quickly, I mean, it's been almost a week, right? It's over a week already yeah. of this calamity. Uh, but let's uh, get in the ring together in an organized fashion, give as much as possible. A lot of people are, are calling me individuals, not organizations. Individuals are calling me saying, uh, can we send coats? Can we send food? And can yeah. that's absolutely for me for my ministry that's impossible we cannot move such things and then when it gets to the border is it going to get there is it going to be distributed uh, as it should because i've had such a bad experience in jordan and my colleagues have had a bad experience in Tur in iraq with sending uh, parcels there so maybe you and i can discuss this to see if there is something that on the ground can be moved uh, but uh, right now, funding is the most important. And how do we keep track of funding is uh, my partners on the ground give us receipts of everything that has been purchased. They give us the names of individuals that has have been helped, the names of churches. If they go through churches, they give us the name of the priest and the church they've gone through. So we keep a very um, close eye on how everything has been spent. Um uh, and also, but see, this is a part of a bigger problem. These, As I said earlier, these people are refugees, whether they're Syrian Muslims or Assyrians from Iraq. They fled their countries due to a war, and they've been caught still for the last eight, nine years in this, in this predicament. For example, Assyrians want to move west, and they haven't been able to. Why? Because UNHCR is not making that happen. IOM is, IOM is not making that happen. So we should come together from a policy perspective as well to help them move. The, so, the, so we need, what I need 
in my ministry is political influence, media influence, and funding. That is what I come with to the table. These are my needs. No, look, uh, I mean, it, it, it's possible. I, I know we can do those type of operations. Uh, like I said, for us, you know, I, I, if people look at the lapel pen I have, that's an Assyrian think tank. If people look at what I have, if they go to my site, they'll see the talent we have is really strategic talent at the geostrategic level. I've told many organizations, and I know me and you have had this discussion, that I can move things at the geostrategic level, even if it comes to palletizing stuff, getting it on a bird. Uh, you know, we're working with some uh, companies here to try to get tents, which we were asked to try to move. I've recently talked about the fact that there's a ship of coal that is available that could be moved into the region. The problem we run into here is a lot of the organizations that do need that help just do not have the funding and the support for us to move it, or we have to get the approval at the governmental level, in this case, that they're not willing to give. Now, uh, uh, again, just as I said earlier, USAID uh, uh, might be in the region, but I haven't seen anything contracted for them to be able to move anything in. So uh, th that's where we can help. Uh, and I will promise you, if uh, there's a capacity and funding for that, we could uh, you know, get that support. We'll have that stuff sent out to you, Juliana, and you guys can distribute it on the ground. The two organizations can work together. Uh, when I created initially United of Senior Appeal, I saw it as a much more broader capability to be able to coordinate the each of the efforts of what all the other organizations uh, were doing out there. One of the reasons we work with the Jacaranda Woman Organization um, in support of the Christians of South Sudan because the Near East Center itself operates uh, to support countries within the East, Near East and adjacent countries at the geostrategic level. The problem is sometimes, like I said, people don't know we exist. People are out there still may not even know that your organization exists. People out there may not even know that my organization exists and what the ability capacity is. I think we have that talent is like I said, in 43 different countries, is a matter of trying to get everybody together and kind of try to focus this effort in support of our operations. Sometimes you have the people, you don't have the money. Sometimes you have the uh, money, you don't have the people. And I think that's one of the problems that uh, those certain organizations constantly have to deal with. But I will tell you that if there's any food palletized capabilities that need to be sent to be distributed, uh, if you do get that support and funding, we can get that down to you and then your organization can go ahead and execute it. Uh, as long as we're saving Assyrians, it doesn't matter who's on the ground doing it. Um, that's that's all that matters and we gotta work together in that effort. Um, and you know, Juliana, if I may say, go ahead. I'm, I'm so sorry, just one last point at this time I, want, I would like to make. Uh, so I've requested my partners there um, to assist the Armenians, to assist the Greeks, uh, to assist if Muslim Turks come to us, I could never turn anyone around, or away, yeah. right? Uh, there to serve humanity. First and foremost, the Assyrians, absolutely. But we are open to the Turks themselves. We are open to Greeks and uh, Armenians because they have immensely, immensely suffered. It's just monumental what they're going through there. I can't, you know, last night I was watching. I haven't slept uh, in days um, on and off last night. I was able to sleep, be asleep a little bit, but there was a video that I was watching, there was this woman trapped in and she was speaking to the rescuer through a very small hole, very small hole. And they were pouring water, uh, hoping that she would catch the water. And they asked her to throw a stone to see which direction it's coming from, from this small hole. And she said, my arm is too short. I can't throw the stone. So finally she did throw the stone. But I, and it was a very short clip and I don't know if they were able to rescue her. And I just closed my eyes for a moment and I said, what would I have done? How would I have felt if, and I'm claustrophobic to begin with. I'm just like my father. I can't breathe in small spaces. What would have happened to me if I were in their shoes? And that's what I want your audience to place themselves in these people's shoes. These people are losing their children have lost their children. There was this man that was standing and screaming. You know how we Middle Easterners are in love with our parents and our parents are everything to us. And he was standing next to this rubble and he was beating himself on his head saying, 
my parents, I hear them. I hear my parents. I can't save them. Please come save them. And I don't know if they were able to save the parents. I, I just can't imagine. So these are stories. We must tell stories. Again, Elie Wiesel was a great storyteller. He's my personal hero. So I always quote him. Uh, we must continue telling stories to our relatives over dinner, to our children and to our neighbors in order for humanity to come together. Now, look, uh, when uh, declaring operations of Mosul took place, uh, the uh, Assyrian villages that were destroyed, I, uh, you know, Assyrians are very quick to come out because they've been through this process before and started sweeping and cleaning the streets. And I told, uh, you know, uh, some of the Assyrian leaders in the region, I said, put a fence around what has been destroyed in some of these villages and leave it as a landmark. So future generation know this is how we were treated when we didn't have our governmental structure to organize and run our own nation. This is what happens. And uh, it's unfortunate because generations have been killed. Um, this is a continuous genocide. Uh, I hate to say it against the Syrian people at any turn. Uh, and it's the reality of what uh, they're dealing with again, continuously. But you know what? At least we're, we're in the fight. Um, Juliana, I know for our audiences, uh, I would tell them that if they take a, uh, we have a QR code on the bottom, it takes them directly to your site uh, for uh, monetary donations. It is important. As a uh, uh, priest friend of mine once said, uh, money is not the issue. It is uh, what you need to solve your problem. Uh, I would highly recommend, uh, please support um, her efforts. How long are you gonna be in the region on the ground, uh, Juliana? I'm going in Turkey. I'm going to be in Turkey for three short days uh, in uh, Jordan for about four days. Uh, I'm unable to accompany the team to Lebanon, but the team will go to Lebanon to record the refugee lives. Well, look, uh, uh, if you guys cannot donate out there to support, at least be able to provide whatever uh, else talent you have, maybe to be able to help them out, uh, they can contact you directly by going to the site. Correct, Juliana? Yes, my personal phone number is there. Uh, my email address is there. So please reach out. At, um, we're 24 hours a day. My phone is always by me. Uh, this is a critical time. So please, my door is open and I will welcome any questions you have. No, much appreciate it. Uh, be safe. I, I know it's uh, going to be difficult. Uh, and for our audiences, keep in mind that people are dying um, minute by minute. Um, and uh, at, a, at a minimum, at least, hopefully, we can give them uh, uh, ability for their family members to give them the honors of a proper burial, um, so they're not just left out there without any type of a support. Uh, and uh, look, Juliana, you get the support from my um, uh, uh, from United Assembly Appeal itself too. Um, I would ask our audiences instead of giving to our organization uh, uh, this week and this month. Uh, provide the support for Juliana's organization because she's on the ground now doing the work um, and whatever we get we can support will support and again if there's anything at the geostrategic level that needs to be moved if you know anybody who needs that and will be able to get it out there to them please let us know so we can at least get those pallets of uh, uh, food and support out uh, to your organization to be able to um, get this done on the ground. And look, uh, through this process, uh, as difficult as it is, Juliana, lessons learned, hopefully uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, you know, unfortunately disasters are gonna be continuous for the Assyrians uh, in the region. Hopefully this will give us an opportunity to learn some lessons and see how else uh, in the future we could be maybe much more closer together when it comes to operations uh, to be able to support you. Uh, Juliana, final that. word for you. I just, uh, I'm grateful to you. Uh, I'm grateful to you for this opportunity. I'm grateful to the audience. Uh, I really appreciate anything. Any s amount of sacrifice is not going to be on notice. And I'm a believer. I uh, will tell you, I've seen miracles happen to those who give because God is pleased and he gives back 10 times, 100 times over. And really, this is the time to stand with humanity during, during these dark hours. And in advance, I thank you all. Thank you very much for being here, Juliana. God bless, Godspeed, and uh, we'll be thank in you. touch. Uh, and uh, hopefully we hear from you back soon again. With that said, to our audiences, please 
again, donate to Iraqi uh, Christian Relief um, and uh, support them with whatever you can. It is very important. Uh, I do want to say a thank you to Sim Production. Fred has done an outstanding job. He always knows how to capture the information that we need um, in the moment. He's produced my show ever since uh, I've had one. And with that said, thank you very much, Fred, for everything you do, giving the opportunity for Juliana and I to be able to discuss this important matter. God bless you, Juliana. Godspeed and in this you. new paradigms. Thank you. Thank you. are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epoch Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. The Epoch Times is independent, we're not controlled by any special interest, and we never will be. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit, a battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. Subscribe today to our digital edition at theepochtimes.com and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. Read the difference in all your devices. We'd love to have you on board.